Hello and welcome back to another episode of The Router. Today joining me I have Dave Durbin from Canva to talk a little bit about image processing and computer graphics. Thank you so much for joining me Dave. Just to start off give us a brief introduction, um, a little bit about yourself for those who don't know you. Cool. Uh, my name's Dave. I work at Canva where I look after the image processing team. I've been with Canva for four years now. Uh, we take care of doing machine learning related transformations and analysis of photos and graphics and all the pictures that you upload to using Canva. Very cool. So first things first, how did you get started at Canva? It's a long story. I was uh, working as a CTO for a fintech company and also doing a part-time PhD. And my PhD was very graphics heavy, but talking to bank managers every day was really hard. So I'd get up, I'd do a couple of hours of PhD work, then I'd go and talk to bank managers about money, and then I'd come back and try and do more PhD work. And doing that context switch twice a day was pretty tiring, and talking to bank managers was pretty tiring. So I started looking for a new job, and this company called Canva kept showing up on the radar. And I didn't really know anything about them. I didn't know why. So I reached out to them and uh, hooked up with Disco, who's one of the recruiters here. And basically, once you've talked to Disco, you're going to be working for Canva, whether you wanted to or not. So yeah, I went through the interview process and here I am. Yeah, very cool. So did you start off in doing computer graphics for Canva or did you start off doing something different and kind of like move into that? Because you kind of founded the team, correct? Sort of. Uh, so, so when I joined Canva, um, you know, one of the things about Canva was that we've obviously we've grown really, really rapidly. And I was really keen to work in computer graphics, but the recruiter sort of said to me, look, we're not doing that stuff with ML right now, but we know that we're going to want to do it. And so uh, we'd kind of like to have you on board now with a view that you'll do this later. So my first jobs were kind of getting to know the Canva infrastructure. I worked in the folder team for a while. Uh, so if you ever put anything in a folder and sort it, that was probably me. Uh, and then I worked in a, a team called Private Content Search, which allowed you to search for the stuff that you've uploaded. And, and part of the problem with searching for the stuff that you uploaded with was a lot of the time the images didn't have any searchable data. So one of the first things that we did in the, the image team was to, to build classification. So we built a classifier to at least do an initial analysis of your photos and, and figure out that it was a dog or a bike or a beach so that the private content search could work properly. I didn't found the team itself. Uh, the team was already doing some work with shaders at print export for Canva, but I guess I've been mostly responsible for moving it over to more analysis and generation and more machine learning focus. So what got you interested in computer graphics then in, in the first place and got you into doing a PhD in them? I guess like from being really young, I, I'm super old. And so when I got my first computer, it was an 8-bit computer. It was a home, it was a BBC micro, and I got to play video games for the first time on my TV. I wanted to write video games. That was what I wanted to do. And the graphics in those games were terrible. They were like 8-bit, you know, now it's cool to have retro graphics, but they were really, really bad, but it was still so much better than anything else I'd seen in my life. And so even as a kid, I got into writing graphics code. I got into writing 3D vector demos. And so when I went off to university, I decided I was going to do computer science and I was going to do artificial intelligence, which was a thing. And part of that was a computer vision course. And the state of the art was mind-blowing at the time but is kind of pedestrian now given where we are uh, but that was back in 86 and obviously there was a bit of a problem in AI at that time because we didn't have enough data we didn't have an internet and we didn't have GPUs so there was a limited amount you could do on a CPU with kind of 10 photographs so fast forward a few years and suddenly we've got GPUs we've got massively parallel processors we've got super deep CNNs uh, and thousands and thousands and thousands of pictures of people's selfies and dinner. So the opportunities to just kind of pick up on that stuff that I learned as a, as a grad and, and apply it every day is huge. It's great. What do you think the future research applications of computer vision will kind of lead us from those 8-bit graphics to something hopefully with a couple more bits? That's a really great question. Um, I think there's a few things. So uh, obviously the, the generation of photos is huge. People are already talking about it. You see the photographs coming out of Dali, where we have kind of avocado chairs, which as long as you don't look at them too hard, look pretty cool. Stock photography has had a good run for a very long time. Um, 
but it's a bit problematic. A lot of stock photography doesn't necessarily represent our users. So um, in some recent analysis we did uh, on stock photos, we find that maybe 75% of people in stock photos are female and in the 20 to 30 age bracket, and I guess beautiful for want of a better word, because that's what stock photos look like. So if you want a stock photo of an old white dude or uh, an Appalachian woman or uh, a 90 year old Indian sailor, they're probably not going to crop up in stock photos. So being able to generate photos that contain photorealistic people in realistic settings and that are diverse is super important. Um, and I believe that we will get to that point. We were already seeing, you know, this person doesn't exist. So we're seeing photorealistic faces again as long as you don't mind them not being bigger than a thousand pixels and as long as you don't look too hard at the hairline but i can only see that becoming more powerful uh, and similarly beyond photos into videos so you know, a video of someone shooting a basket or a video of someone running a marathon um why why limit it to the reality why not also generate those scenes uh, and allow people to interactively edit them to say well okay yeah that looks good but make the sky bluer or make the basketball bigger or change the angle and look at it from a different angle. So I think that's where we're going, the ability to compose photorealistic photos and, and, and to allow people like you or me to be able to edit them without any massive, huge skill at 3D rendering. Do you think this kind of thing will also come into the film industry itself, like into actually creating films without people even in them? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so this has been a big deal in Hollywood for some time um, where Artists have a right or their agents negotiate a right to their image. Uh, and so when they go in to make a movie, uh, they still own their image. Uh, and so the interesting piece is if you have, and we have had for a while now, actors who've made movies long after they've died. So in The Fast and the Furious, Paul Walker appeared in a movie after he was dead. It's not now uncommon. Carrie Fisher appeared in the latest Star Wars movies, you know, as a young version of herself. Um, we already have pretty decently convincing CGI actors and actresses. I guess the question is, does that go the whole hog? And, and if so, what does that mean for existing stars? If we can just digitize them and have them perform anything, how do, how do they continue to own the rights to their appearance and their mannerisms and their style? And going forward, what if we can just generate digital avatars of people that don't exist, but meet some standard for, for interestingness you know why is it that some people are famous actors and some people aren't what is it that makes Carrie Fisher awesome but uh you know maybe someone else not so much so I think it's inevitable we will definitely have you know CGI generated people in movies some of them may be modeled on actual actors some of them may be completely generated I don't see why it wouldn't happen I think there's some interesting social questions about what happens when it does yeah, I think that's de definitely going to be interesting for sure. Like the way art in general has changed when almost anything and everything can be generated and like the input of people on, I guess, the output and what people are expecting and how it can all all come together, I guess. Yeah, I, I think um, the interesting part about the, the movies is it's not so much can we CGI generate actors because we know we can do that and we can do it really, really well. Uh, what happens when MLs start writing screenplays? Um, that's the interesting stuff. So we have GPT-3 out there right now, and it's doing a pretty decent job of, you know, doing the code co-pilot, but also generating text. GPT-4 is being trained at the moment. It's going to have 100 trillion nodes, which is just vast. That's 500 times the size of GPT-3. Um, no one's really certain at the moment what you can do when you have a a model trained on a huge corpus of language like that. You know, there are some people that are saying, you know, this looks like artificial general intelligence. Others are saying, nope, it's just a bigger language model. That will be interesting. But, but imagine what happens when we get MLs that can write screenplays uh, and then digitize them and generate the films and generate the set. What happens to that whole industry? Will people be interested in watching them or will it be like a lot of ML art? It's kind of cool and nichey. Uh, and some people look at it and go, that's really awesome. I want that on my wall. And others look at it and go, yeah, nah. And so maybe we're always going to need humans in the loop to make it appeal to humans. Kind of on a, a different tangent, but a bit related. How do you think like um, industry plays a role in this versus like uh, more research focused centers? Because obviously a lot of the cutting edge research does kind of come from 
um, like purely academic uh, sources at the moment. And a lot of these kind of generation things do a little bit for, for everyone to use. But of course, more and more papers uh, are coming from research sources, especially like really big tech companies such as like Google, um, Amazon, every big company that you can think of basically is, you know, trying to get their cutting edge uh, R&D uh, to be prominent out there. How do you think that might evolve or is currently evolving? Do you think it's shifting more towards an industry focus and as the drive for consumers wanting more of these products kind of rises that companies will take over and being the forefront of this kind of technology? Yeah, I I think that, you know, if you're a Google or a Microsoft or uh, an Amazon, you have some really big advantages because you've got all of the processing power and you've got all the data. So, you know, if you want to build a rich machine learning model, that's kind of what you're going to need, processing power and data. So there's a really big ethical question for me about how that data is, is safeguarded and, and how we look after that and make sure that it's not being abused. Because Google owns your mail and calendars and docs and spreadsheets. And so that's a lot of text data that they can use to train models. Now, I don't think that anyone explicitly thought they were going to consent to have their data used that way when they signed up for, I don't know, let's say Google Docs. But in the terms and conditions, you've said that you're happy for them to go use your data to improve the service. And I guess this falls under that umbrella. So, so these big companies definitely have a leg up in terms of the things that you need to train models. But I think there's always going to be room for innovation and there's always room for niches. You know, look at Netflix, for example. Their recommendation model is, is fabulous. Uh, and that's curated off the set of their data. So they understand better than anybody else what, you know, movie preferences look like. And, and Amazon wouldn't have a clue about that largely. And then TikTok, you know, TikTok's recommendation engine is, is hugely successful. And it's one of the reasons why people believe it's, you know, doing so fabulously well, that you always kind of see stuff that you want to see. So within a particular space, within a particular niche, um, there are going to be apps or, or businesses behind those apps that, that allow you to, for example, make good recommendations in a particular space or, or do good manipulations on images. But I think for sort of general stuff, so, so like image generation, movie generation, uh, even text generation, the advantages are going to fall to the people with the big machinery, the big hardware and the big data. And that's largely going to be the big corporates at the moment. Yeah, like especially with the looking at a lot of the top of the line papers, even just on classification data sets that have a lot of diversity, it really does feel like so many hours on training TPUs and the number of just TPUs even in use is just astronomical and kind of kind of reducing the ability for the layman to try and make an impact in that field. Yeah, definitely. And and we're seeing, you know, we saw Elon Musk stand up a couple of weeks ago and let's just move on from the Tesla bot briefly. But he stood up and he was like, you know, we're training autopilot and we're developing custom hardware to do that. So, you know, we've got, I can't remember if it's 1.25 trillion transistors on a, on, a, on a wafer that we're using for that. There's been an announcement just this week from GPT-4 training that uh, Cerebras has produced a 22 centimeter wafer with 850,000 cores on it. So there's now dedicated hardware being produced purely to train neural networks. Now, that's way out of the league of you or me or, or any kind of home experimenter or small startup. And I guess we see a couple of things. Anyone can learn this stuff at home. So the principles are the same. And not every classifier or every generator or transformer needs to handle kind of global scale text. The MNIST data set, which is one that everyone's going to start with and play with, still works perfectly well on your home laptop, and you can classify letters and numbers. And that's pretty cool. That's, you know, it's a, a problem that's a real problem. You could apply that in your home on, on a home scale problem, that'd be fine. But if you want to train super huge models, then you're going to need super huge data. But not everyone does. So I guess I think there will be an acceleration and the, the big end of town will move away and build more and more sophisticated models and more and more sophisticated hardware and custom training. Um, Microsoft did this with their system on a chip. They, they put a classifier onto a chip and built it into their AR headset, into the HoloLens 2, because they felt it would be useful to augment the visual data with a classification label to, to help apps to leverage that. So definitely that raises the bar for access. But on the other hand, they also give you an SDK so you can 
write your own code to use that. You know, we're rolling out TPUs, but they're available to anybody who wants to pay the 20 cents an hour or $1.85 an hour or whatever it is to, to use them for training. So there's always scope and there's always options. So in some ways the bar is lowered. You don't need to go buy a GPU at home. You can rent one. And in fact, a question I saw on a forum this week was, uh, what laptop should I buy to train machine learning models? And the answer was, you shouldn't. You should buy a cool laptop that you can write code on that's got a good screen for watching movies. And you should hire GPUs from Amazon because by the time you've spent the $5,000 that you would have spent on a laptop, you could have been training for five years. So in some ways, the bar to entry is lower. You can get your hands on high-end hardware by renting it from these big guys. So I think it's a mix. I, there's good and bad in there, but I think no one should be discouraged by the fact that the top end of town are, are building really cool stuff that's hard for you to replicate. Well, kind of on that note, how do you recommend someone could get started and get involved in kind of the computer vision not even the state of art just learning about it and even becoming part of the canva team yeah so so first of all becoming part of the canva team we are hiring we're always hiring we want great people who are passionate about democratizing design uh and you know being good humans so if if you're interested get a cv to us the things that we care about are really more about who you are and your passion and your energy and your ability to learn and and grow because we can teach you stuff that's easy uh but you have to be able to learn stuff first so so you know bring your a game bring your best self if you want to have a good impact curating your own portfolio of stuff online is probably not a bad starting point but if you want to kind of start to explore machine learning and image processing uh and you haven't got a starting point I would definitely recommend taking a look at the Google machine learning tutorials. Uh, they're really easy, really accessible. They have some sort of follow along uh, notebooks that you can run, play around with the MNIST data set, build your own classifier for handwriting. You'll do it in an afternoon and it's really simple. And then you get sucked into the black hole. Build a simple cat dog classifier. Uh, there are heaps of tutorials on the web. Again, all of these days you can do all of this in an afternoon. Uh, and, and you'll start to get interesting results. And then experiment, just be curious, ask questions like, what if, what happens if I do this? What happens uh, if, I, if I use more data or different data? Because that's how you make discoveries, right? Uh, the tutorials will tell you how to find the tools, how to set up the tools and use them, but it's your imagination and your questions that will, will drive you to do interesting things. Yeah, cool, I totally agree. I think uh, it's all about just trying to do stuff and seeing what's out there. And because there are so many online resources out there, it's you can be pretty unstoppable as long as you're putting your mind to whatever you're interested in. And I think it starts with like an idea, just, you know, wouldn't it be cool if I, that's that's how all great things start? Wouldn't it be cool if I could, you know, write an app that identified plants in my house? Or, or rooms in my house. Maybe I could take a photograph of a room and it could tell me whether it's the lounge or the bedroom or whatever. Or maybe I could take a photo of uh, my friends and maybe try to match names to them. It doesn't have to be huge. It doesn't have to be big and complicated. It can just be a little thing for you as a little project. But I think starting with a, a question and going, how would, I how would I solve this? And especially if it's a problem. Because if it's a problem, then you're going to be more motivated to fix it than if it's just a bit of curiosity. Bringing it back to um, working for Canva, what's something in the immediate future or in the a little bit more distant future that you're excited for? Well, we're not allowed to talk about all the things that we're working <laughs> on because it's all top secret. But I guess what we can say is our team is part of a new group dedicated to building a photo editor and, and really bringing some cool photo editing tools to Canva. Um, so I'm pretty excited about us starting to build out some really great photo editing features on top of what you can already do with designs. I won't say too much about them, but th there's lots of really cool stuff in the pipeline. Uh, I think distant future, well, I'd refer you back to the conversation about generators uh, and images and video. I, I, I think it's really gonna be important for Canva to be uh, focusing on how we might generate images. Uh, we, we do have a big stock photo collection, but it's gonna be important for us to be able to provide photos that people want uh, and to help them to edit those in maybe non-conventional ways. So instead of launching Photoshop and trying to draw wiggly lines around things and then color them in, you know, being able to say, oh, I'll make it a football, not a rugby ball, or make it red, not blue, or make it be night, not day. These all sound like kind of 
problems that that people actually have that we'd like to be solving and we're about making complex things simple so if we could do it by interpreting a simple word or gesture as opposed to making you do 20 operations in photoshop then that feels like it'd be a good thing and do you think that in achieving that future canva will move towards the other really big companies in like doing research involving uh, all of the tpus in the world and um, using these crazy big models and that kind of in that kind of direction or do you think canva will more continue to apply i guess what is already out there so our mission is to democratize design is to allow anybody to design anything that's really the space that we're in and design definitely includes things like for example visual ai and generating and editing and analyzing photos but it also is things like what's the best font to use with this image or what's the best placement of this text but it's also things like making sure that we support the language that you choose to speak and present you with the design elements that that resonate most strongly with you uh, because of your culture or your context or your personal background and so while ml is going to have an important place in canva it's not the heart of what we do uh, and it's a tool that we will use to to continue to deliver you know a uh, what we think is a great product to people to enable them to communicate visually. As much as we use our ML to do that, we can't forget the human beings who are actually using our tool. Very cool. Um, yeah, I think that's all my questions for today. If you have any advice or um, any message to those out there listening who might want to get into the image processing industry. Yeah, uh, look, I guess two pieces of advice. The first one would be Listen to what you're passionate about. If you're passionate about image processing, then that's what you should work in. Uh, and, and it may take you time to find the right job for you. And it may take you a few rejections and it might take you building a portfolio by yourself, but, but stick to it and pursue it and be tenacious. Don't, don't get sidetracked into, well, you know, I really, really want to work in image processing, but there's this job in a bank and it pays pretty well. Follow your passion, follow your dream and stick with it. And then the second thing is keep curious learn as much as you can. There's plenty of blogs, online resources, tutorials, but, but do, you can read all the books in the world, but they won't help you make a thing. So, so from, from my point of view, if you're working with images, it's about making things. So, so build, build code, build demos, put them on GitHub, post them on the web, share them with your friends and just keep exploring and keep curious and apply to camp, obviously. Of course, of course. Well, thank you so much for joining me, Dave. And thanks for everyone who tuned in to another episode of The Router.